Hello and welcome to our virtual panel event, The Power of Social Media. I'm your moderator, Melaine Kenyon, Vice President for Information Technology and Chief Information Officer at Damon College. Thank you for joining us. This is the sixth in an ongoing series of live virtual panels to discuss current events. Thanks go out to our sponsor, the graduate programs at Damon College for inspiring this event series and these conversations. And so to begin, I'm going to turn to our panelists and have them introduce themselves and state their title or role. Hello, I'm uh, Aaron Joyle. I'm a professor of marketing here at Damon College. Hi, my name is Dima Mata, and I'm a paid social media manager for Media Assembly, which is an agency based out of New York City. I'm Anthony Decembri, a senior digital communications and social media manager at Cornell University and a Damon graduate, 2005. Hi, I'm Anna Holfer. I'm associate director of paid social also at Media Assembly. Hi, my name is David Seifert. I am the marketing and digital media specialist here at Damon College. Hi, my name is Javon Jordan. I'm currently a senior here at Damon College and I'm the founder of Wildcat Media and Entertainment. Thank you, panelists. Before we start, we wanna first point out that we're aware of the privilege of being employed right now during the context of our discussions about work. The effects of the COVID-19 pandemic have been very difficult for people across the nation. And we wanna be mindful of the detrimental effects of it in every aspect of our lives, including work and employment. Our first question today is going to go to Aaron. Aaron, what is the power of social media? Well, there's a number of powers of social media. You, you can't really say there's one specific thing. So let me go through a, a pretty quick list here that is by no means exhaustive. First off, social media has the power to create connections between humans. We have the ability to exchange information across a far broader number of people than we ever have at any point in human history. The way that people can forge connections across this planet using social media is absolutely unprecedented. More specific to some of the things we're talking about here in branding or marketing, uh, it's given power to consumers in ways that consumers have never had. And I'll give you a brief example. Imagine that you were consuming a product. It doesn't matter what it is. Let's say it's your cell phone and the phone ceases to work. At any point in history, and I realized that there were not cell phones 100 years ago, but if there had been, who could you really tell? Five people, 10 people, family and friends? Nowadays, you can share your negative experiences about brands or your positive experiences about brands with hundreds of thousands of individuals. It's given a lot of power to consumers. It's also given power to brands. Brands have the ability to reach far larger audiences these days. They can reach potential consumers in other countries that they're not yet doing business in to create demand for them in those markets. They can reach people that are not yet in their target markets. They can start thinking about aspirational brands. Wow, I, I can't afford a car yet. I'm only 16 years old, but man, I'd love to drive one of those one day. Those types of things in ways they simply couldn't before. And it's given people and brands the power to be authentic, to exchange, to share, to collaborate, and to create information online. It's really amazing stuff. But we do have to acknowledge that there's a negative part of this, a negative side to this as well. Social media has given power to rumor and negative stories. It's a kind of an interesting quirk of humans that we give more credence and we see negative information as being more diagnostic than positive information. I actually have a citation for those of you that are uh, in the audience with an academic uh, bent here. Uh, this is the negative information weighs more heavily on the brain, the negativity bias in evaluative categorizations. Uh, Larson Smith and uh, Cassiopo from the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, October 98. Essentially what this is saying though, is that all that negative information that's out there, that people say, oh, you shouldn't pay attention to that. We're drawn to it as human beings. Uh, there's also a power for those negative stories to be reintroduced. Uh, here in Buffalo, we have the example of Josh Allen, who's become a local hero. But several years ago when he was drafted, some tweets that he'd made when he was a young person, 14 or 15 years old, that used uh, language that was absolutely racist in nature, uh, citing rap lyrics, but it doesn't matter the context here, resurfaced. 
I can't speak for any of the other panelists or, or anyone in the audience, certainly, but thinking about some of the things that I did, not saying in any way that I have recollections of these things or anything specific, but there's no record of that because I'm in my mid 40s and this happened 30 years ago. Now the things that young people are doing are categorized, they're videotaped, they're put on social media, and those things can come back. Uh, outside of the sports sphere, if you don't follow that, we also saw the same thing happen with a lady by the name of uh, Camila Caballo, uh, who was a, a singer formerly in the uh, girl group Fifth Harmony, uh, where uh, several tweets of hers from a number of years ago resurfaced uh, in terms of uh, some negative things that she had said. So that's one potential negative power uh, that it has. Uh, there's also the power of what we call cancel culture or, or deplatforming. And certainly there are people who say and do things on social media where they don't deserve to have a platform given to them. But to cite another example of some of the issues that happened with this, some of you may be familiar with the beauty, uh, the beauty vlogger, if I could say that, James Charles, who a few years ago was essentially canceled by others that he did business with. There were some accounts or some statements made about sexual improprieties on his side. And more than a year later, it emerged that most, if not all of those things were exaggerated or hadn't happened. And the pushback towards his presence online was created by those that were jealous of the success that he'd had with his beauty uh, YouTube channel. So certainly you can see there's some negative powers that social media has given to humanity as well. All in all, I certainly think that social media lends more towards the positive side, that power of being authentic and authentic connections between human beings and between brands is worth the negatives. But I would say that the power of social media certainly encompasses both sides and is nearly unlimited. We've never seen anything like this in uh, human history before. Thank you, Aaron. Um, very interesting, very way, uh, fantastic way for us to segue into all the questions we have for our panelists today. Um, our first question now, uh, the next one is going to Anthony. Anthony, in general, how should brands or companies use social media to communicate with consumers? And how is that different from regular or traditional communication platforms such as email or advertising? This is a great question. Um, and it really depends on the organization. So you always have to start with the goals, right? The goals of the organization and make sure you're supporting those goals throughout uh, the process. The key pieces to it, because each organization is different, is one, you want to build knowledge. Um, and two, you want to develop that positive perception of the organization. So bringing out that culture, that internal culture, and really connecting with the audience. Uh, three, you want to build community. So you want to build community around your uh, channels. You want to build community around um, these different people within your organization and depending on how you're positioning your organization. And then four, you could use it for from a customer service standpoint. So if you're doing this through the entire process, you're really having two types of content. One, that priority messaging that you're pushing out. This might be your call to action, your dates, deadlines, things that you really want to push out there. Often out of just those things, they can be really boring for an audience. And that doesn't differentiate from a lot of the, the push uh, communications that you do like email. But um, when you give that context by putting photos out there of your team, by putting, like you're uh, doing, I'm in higher education. So uh, putting photos of your campus out there, talking about what individual students are doing, connecting students with your audience, that gives it context, right? So that's contextual marketing um, and contextual content. And then when you push out that the priority messaging, um, it, it's a little bit more palatable and uh, certainly connects the audience a little bit better um, when those dates, deadlines, and calls to action come out. Great. Thank you so much, Anthony. Uh, David, our next question is for you. We commonly hear that social media is a space for young people, but is that true? Do you have to be young to create good social media? Uh, that is a great question. The short answer is no, your age really doesn't dictate whether or not you can create good or bad social media content. Um, I mean, young in this context, I would say is kind of a relative term. Uh, so for me, I'm in my mid twenties. I, uh, I run our social media accounts here at Damon College and I would be considered young 
by some people, but from my perspective, you know, someone who's in high school uh, or starting out their college years uh, who are in their target audience, they would be young to me. So it depends on, you know, who you're asking, but I would say that young people, you know, people from the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s, have the advantage of uh, having technology be a little more accessible through their youth. Um, I mean, I remember when having, you know, our Windows XP family computer and uh, dial up internet. And I remember the birth of YouTube. That was a, a, a crazy time. But, you know, young people have, you know, access to smartphones and tablets and computers more so than, I don't want to say older people, but from folks from a different generation. Um, so it's young people still have a story, a story to share, um, and they just might know the tools for content creation and distribution a little bit better than some other folks. Um, and then also too, like when you look at like what good content is, um, you know, that also might be subject subjective, you know, like I love food. Um, you know, I was, I was talking earlier today about some, some food stuff on Instagram with some folks. Uh, and that's something that, that I personally love. So I'm on Instagram looking for high quality food pictures and, and food videos and recipes and things like that. Um, you know, when it comes to photos or video or copywriting, um, you have your, your technical definitions of what makes things good. Um, but I guess you can say that the beauty is in the eye of the beholder, if you will. Um, so, you know, I'm, I don't mean to get a little philosophical there, but uh, there's a few pillars though that you can relate to for good social media content. So, you know, does it educate someone on something? Are you looking to solve a problem? You know, if I'm looking how to fix a kitchen sink, can I look up a YouTube video on how to do that so I don't have to call a plumber? Does it entertain you? Does it make you laugh? Does it make you cry? Does it make you feel some sort of emotion? And are you compelled to do something afterwards? Uh, does it inform you? Like, is it the news of the day? Uh, does it help you stay up to date with the world around you? And then I think one that's really important and, and doesn't get a whole lot of attention is you know, when it comes to your social media content, does it have a form of social currency for you and your social group? Um, you know, does it help you engage with certain people? Like what I would share for my colleagues here at Damon might be a little different than what I would share a friend group, uh, you know, with like a meme I would find on Twitter. So I guess getting back to the question, like, no, I don't think you have to be young to, to create good social media content. Um, I'm gonna, I'm early on in the panel, but I'm gonna be the first one to reference our, the Bernie Sanders memes from last week. Uh, sure, Bernie Sanders did not go to the inauguration to become a meme, but uh, we can see what became of that. You know, uh, he's on sweatshirts now, he sold sweatshirts from it and donated all of the proceeds to, uh, to charity. So um, that was just, you know, a very quick thing to happen and people jumped on it and, and made, made what it is what it is. And, you know, I find them funny still. Um, and then some other examples would be, you know, like I said, I, I like food. So I'm going to mention Guy Fieri because why not? He is totally self-aware of who he is on, on you know, Twitter and, and uh, Instagram. And he totally memes himself all the time and he, he knows what he's doing. And then uh, one other example that came about last year, um, probably, I don't, don't want to say mid uh, quarantine, but it blew up on TikTok a little bit. It was a YouTube channel or a creator called Dad, How Do I? And this channel gained popularity last year through TikTok. And essentially it was content that was you know, information that you normally a father figure would share with people. So like, how do I shave? How do I uh, change the oil in my car? And now like that is a well-established brand. And I think there's like a product deal with Lowe's or Home Depot now. So, and that person essentially, I think in his 50s, so he's a little bit older. So I think all that's just to say, no, as long as you have a, a good story and, and a good message, you don't have to be young to, to make good content on social media. I'd like to dive in here as well, just uh, very briefly with a couple of things. First off, I appreciate David making the point about you don't have to be young to create good social media. But I do think as someone who I, I believe I'm the oldest person on this panel, I'm a Gen Xer and I think I'm the only one here. Um, I think you certainly should also consult with young people for that authenticity if they're within the target market that you're going for. But I think that's true of anything. If I was a marketer trying to reach people in their mid to early 20s, that's my target market. Even if it's outside of social media, I would wanna have some of those people 
uh, working with me or working for me to tell me about the authenticity because that's something that's a little removed from where I am as a man who's now in his early to mid 40s. Uh, there was also a question that came out of the viewers here asking, does age dictate which social media platforms that people use? And I would say that age doesn't dictate it, but there is a strong correlation there. And what I mean by that is people tend to get set in their ways, whether it's through social media or other types of, uh, of dealings in everyday life. So those of us that grew up using Facebook as our primary communication form still use it an awful lot. As a matter of fact, last year, this uh, uh, statistic even shocked me when I saw it. There were more video views, 12.3 billion on Facebook than there were on YouTube, 11.3 billion. So young people are moving away from that platform in droves. They're not signing up for it anymore, but there still is a thriving community that's there because that's what they're used to. Younger people are looking for uh, TikTok or Instagram and, and moving that way. So I don't think age dictates what you, you use, but I think that the platforms you get used to, like anything else in your life, do dictate going forward what you use. I wouldn't be surprised if 15 years from now, we have another platform that has replaced Instagram, let's say, but a group of 30 year olds still and 35 year olds still creates and correlates their, their Instagram content because that's the, pro, the platform that they grew up on. Um, so that was a great question from the audience. Yeah, I could kind of, I could kind of chime in on that. Um, so, so Wildcat Mean Entertainment, we have a crew of about 12 individuals, um, mostly freshmen, sophomores, but we actually do have one individual, her name is Cheryl. Um, she's an elderly woman. She's an alumni of Damon. And she reached out to me two years ago when I started on Wildcat Me Entertainment. And I was honestly surprised um, the fact that she was willing to learn. You know, there's no to say that there's no limitation to content creation. Anybody can make content. Um, it all matters. It all bottles down to the target audience that you're trying to go after. Um, and, you know, shout out to Sarah. Um, she wants to do a podcast and you know, we're fully supportive in her creating her podcast. So yeah, there's no limitations on age. That's true. Um, thank you to David, Aaron, and Javon for answering that particular question. Um, I do want to um, move on to Dima and then we'll address one of the questions from our audience. Um, Dima, social media seems to be rather a rather permanent um, record of opinions, but it might not reflect a person's real thoughts or attitudes. How should social media users consider this idea? Thank you for this question. And thanks for having me on today's panel. I actually recently listened to a podcast that touched on this and the discussion really resonated with me. I do believe that a person's real thoughts and attitudes are reflected on their social media in that moment in time. But people also grow and learn and change from who they were in those moments in time. We have such a fear of being caught in an imperfect moment that our fight or flight kicks in when old social media posts or tweets are resurfaced, and that's because of the backlash that we've seen time and time again. I absolutely believe that people need to be held accountable for their words and actions, but I also believe that we as a society need to allow people the opportunity to learn and grow from their mistakes, because if we don't, then we're just telling each other that real progress isn't attainable. People need to become more comfortable with acknowledging that we're human and we will mess up. But when those people make mistakes, we need to learn to recognize the difference between just plain ignorance and harmful behavior. We can educate and provide tools to those who are willing to learn, but it's much harder to reform a history and pattern of harmful behavior. And if it is the latter, to continue to hold those individuals or people accountable for their actions. Great, thank you, Dima. I think that is a great segue into one of our audience questions. I'm just going to read that from the chat. Can anybody discuss the imperative for teaching age appropriate digital, digital literacy throughout K through 12 plus? Opportunities to learn how platforms work, identifying false information, content ethics and internet safety. And I'll turn that to any one of our panelists. Um, I mean, I think I remember being in grammar school where you were constantly told that what you read on the internet is not true. Uh, and that was a, a point in time, I feel, when you were just kind of like opening up MS Paint or a Microsoft Word document. And the internet sure was a thing, but, you know, it was it was dial up and high speed internet like wasn't as prevalent as it is today. Um, I definitely think for future generations moving forward, you know, 
I don't have children, um, but I, I have nieces and nephews and they know how to use iPads. They know how to use phones. They know how to like find Pokemon games on my phone when I hand them off to them and they just like know what to do. Um, specifically from a point of, of false information and fake news. Uh, I mean, you look at today, just the number of even adults who don't un- have enough from a media literacy standpoint to understand what's fake, what's real and what's not. Um, you know, it, it's more than just looking at a news headline that you'd see on Twitter or Facebook. And I think what we've seen in, in our nation over the last couple of weeks, I mean, not just the last couple of weeks, but um, what we've seen, just the, the spread of fake information and fake news and the way people have rallied together. Um, I think it's on educators, you know, as I'm not an educator here, but I do interact with students every once in a while. Like I've, I've worked with Javon on quite a few projects, but um, for our kids in, in K through 12, like that needs to be something that is addressed early on because obviously this is not going anywhere anytime soon. Just to, to dive in with that as well, I, I think David made a very good point about it's not just the K through 12s that need to be taught this. Uh, again, I don't mean to keep speaking as the older voice here, but it just uh, lent itself to that. I, I think it's really telling that the same people who 25 and 30 years ago when I was a child were telling me not to talk to strangers and to be cautious are the same people who now are in their 60s and their 70s who are the most gullible or the most uh, susceptible, perhaps is the better word, not gullible, most susceptible to seeing things online and accepting it as fact. People end up in social media sometimes in their own little bubbles and they can exclude through not friending or through defriending or through not uh, participating in certain platforms, other outside sources of information. So kind of back to the first point, another power of social media on the negative side is our ability to surround ourselves with information that's an echo chamber that just echoes what we're hearing. So I think uh, to connect it back to the question, it's not just important to teach this at K through 12 level, but perhaps people my age and older, I'm again in my mid forties, need reminder or remedial courses about this as well so that we don't fall into these traps of seeing, oh, well, I'm seeing us in social media. So of course that's the way things are. Just to, just to add to it, um, <clears throat> there's, there's really not a good way, right, today. And the problem that we're running into today actually is just the tip of the iceberg. You know, in a couple of years, we're going to see deep fakes out there where we're not going to be able to tell the difference between someone actually saying something and someone not when governments are uh, really facilitating uh, these echo chambers to, to really um, harm other nations. It's going to be a bigger problem that we're, you know, social media is going to look very different in a year or two years from now as this goes through. Facebook can't solve this, Instagram can't solve this. So really one of the viewers commented critical thinking, that's the only, the only thing we can teach right now. So critical thinking across the board, does this make sense? Um, so, and as you're looking at these things, looking at the source, do you trust the source? So really critical thinking and, and looking at the source. Thank you, Anthony. I also wanna bring up too, another question from uh, the chat just to, um, put out to our panelists as well, which segues again very nicely. Um, how do you utilize social media to reverse the damage that the medium has created through the proliferation of misinformation? All right, well, if we're all just gonna hesitate here, let me, I don't mean to turn this into the, uh, the Aaron show in any way, but uh, in terms of, of dealing with the proliferation of information, I, I don't mean to be a, kind of a, a, a bearer of bad news, but I, I don't necessarily know that we can completely ever turn that off or stem the tide. Uh, Anthony made the point about deep fake technology that's coming out, and we're just going to see increases in, in technology, and humans are going to have to get smarter and use their critical thinking skills. It's, it's not going to be a matter of stemming the tide of negative or disinformation online. If anything, we're gonna see more of that in the years to come. It's going to be teaching people how to recognize things about what would, to again, use uh, deep fakes as an uh, example here, what would indicate that this wasn't actually said by this politician or by this celebrity. Now, I don't necessarily know off the top of my head exactly how you would identify that. I know that there are technological tools that can be used and perhaps someone with more of a tech knowledge can speak to that specifically, but I do believe it's gonna go beyond 
uh, just uh, trying to stem the tides or passing laws or restricting this, it's really going to speak to higher education and, and or K through 12 education, giving people the critical thinking skills and then reiterating the importance of those critical thinking skills and critical thinking analysis when you're confronted with information. But uh, I don't necessarily know there's anything we can do to stem that tide. Yeah, and I think just to add in here, um, just from the education standpoint, I really do believe that we need to give educators the resources and how to kind of navigate this space. Um, you know, they're new to this type of world too and trying to educate, you know, their classrooms of how do we teach critical thinking in this social space? How do we kind of navigate this? How are, you know, people reacting to these sort of things? And I, I, it, it comes to my mind of, you know, a few years ago when, when Facebook and Google were, were in the Senate, right? And the senators, government leaders were asking the most basic questions about social media and they just didn't understand how it worked. And there's that education gap from the top and it comes all the way down to the bottom, right? So I think um, really developing those resources and putting, putting space there to really kind of help facilitate that education because it, it's a long game. It, it's not going away as everybody kind of mentioned on the call. Thank you, um, Anna. Actually, the next question is for you too, and thank you for answering the, the comment from our audience. Um, Anna, many of us have heard the term cancel culture, but what does it really mean? How should individuals and brands conduct themselves on social media because of the impact of cancel culture? Yeah, this is this is a good one. And I think Aaron and Dima actually just touched on it earlier in this call. So I just kind of want to, you know, dive a little deeper into into this question. So essentially, you know, cancel culture is basically just the idea of, you know, calling or calling out or public shaming a person or brand, you know, due to what some consider to be offensive remarks that a person or a brand has made. You know, sometimes these comments could have been recent. And some of these comments could have been 20 plus years ago that were kind of dredged up, right? So um, you know, many people believe that this this canceling or this calling out is is an outlet. It's a positive outlet in many ways because it it allows a light to kind of be shown on issues um, that are in need of changing. Um, you know, the social norms that society just hasn't caught up with, as I mentioned before, because this is such a fast moving space that we're living in. Um, you know, social media, um, as Aaron mentioned before, social media gives people a platform to address cultural issues, you know, such as racism, transphobia, you know, misogyny, etc. So it's almost as if society um, within this cancel culture space is saying, wait, this isn't right, you know, I'm going to call you out on this, and it's going to be a very public way. And I want everybody to know that, you know, what you're doing is not right, or I don't believe in what you're doing, right? Um, so just a few examples about, you know, uh, from cancel culture, which I think we're all pretty much aware of. Um, I don't know if you can remember, but that uh, the Central Park Karen, right? Her video went viral over the summer um, when she accused a bird watcher of harassing her in Central Park. Uh, you know, when this video posted, it went viral. Um, and this occurrence, actually, it cost her her job, her dog, and her reputation. Um, another example would be, you know, everybody is aware of Ella DeGeneres and the allegations of her, you know, poor treatment of staff on her set. And as a result, you know, people boycotted her show, her ratings dropped. Um, and now, you know, this shadow is kind of carried with her forever. Um, so I always ask the question, you know, personally and professionally, you know, is cancel culture good? Um, you know, some people believe it, it holds people accountable for terrible things that they've done, um, but it also could be viewed as this like instant ruining of brands or people that have, you know, a lapse of judgment 20 years ago. Um, you know, I think it really comes down to, and I think Dima actually mentioned this, so it's great that we kind of um, are, are aligned on our thoughts here. Um, it really comes down to how people address their cancellation cancellations. Um, because you know we've seen we've seen this happen so much, and we almost ex expect an apology statement or you know a video of a person or a celebrity or brand apologizing for their actions, um, you know. But it's something that people do need to address and need to be aware of, you know, how they hurt people or how you know um, they were misinformed or uneducated in the space that they commented on, right? Um, you know, but I always like to think on the, uh, the other side of the coin, the coin, you know, is this enough? You know, can you come back from being canceled? Um, you know, I think essentially, you know, at the end of the day, it really comes down to the situation. And, you know, I think we're going to continue to see how, you know, like I said, celebrities and brands and even politicians, you know, how they come back from situations that they've dealt with and how they're going to kind of continue to navigate this space. Um, so I think the second part of the question you mentioned is, you know, how should brands conduct themselves to avoid being canceled? 
um, you know, just saying the same sentiment that everybody did on this call, you know, social is alive and it's present in our everyday lives and it's not going away. And the fact that, you know, social media and the opinions on social media aren't going away anytime soon, um, you know, it's best, at least in my opinion, um, keep those communications professional, um, you know, try to steer clear of anything that may hurt or offend people. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you want to go into business, you go into business to, to fulfill a need, right, to, to help people. Um, so, you know, essentially just try to focus on, you know, your business model, you know, how you can best serve your clients and how you can just continue to grow your business. Um, but again, this is something interesting that I, I'm kind of looking forward to see how it manifests into 2021, especially coming off a political year. Um, so again, I don't think this is going to waste anytime soon, but i um, curious to see how brands and, or if, even if we see this kind of fade away, we, you know, maybe people are tired of it. They're like, okay, you know, this other person's canceled. I hear you. I understand. I'm not going to listen to it anymore. They almost become immune to it. So um, I'm interested to see how this kind of moves through 2021. I think an important point to, to make here as well is the importance to of always acting online as though s something negative that you say could be seen. Uh, the story that I remember, this is about five years old now, a woman by the name of Justine Sacco, uh, some of you may remember this, uh, was a, a director of corporate communications based in New York City and who tweeted uh, back in, in uh, 2015 when she was getting on a flight, and this is an absolutely awful thing to say, uh, and I'm not going to, to, uh, to repeat what she quoted or what she, she said, but it was, a, it was a racist and, and just an awful thing she said. Uh, but she, when uh, they, she was interviewed, because this is one of the first times that cancel culture ever really blew up. So she was interviewed by the New York Times Magazine afterwards, um, which may in and of itself say something about white privilege that a, a Caucasian woman said this got canceled and she's the one who got interviewed, but that's getting away from my point. In any case, her point was she said this and she only had 170 Twitter followers, people that she knew, people in industry, people that she thought would understand she was saying this uh, in uh, a, a, a humorous context, which again, she made an indefensible statement, but had no idea. She got on an 11 hour flight was completely disconnected from the world. And when she uh, landed, she was the number one worldwide trend on Twitter from 170 followers 11 hours later. I don't think anything had prepared people prior to that time. And again, she said something indefensible and I in no way defend her and she deserved what happened to her. But having that blow up where I don't think humans have ever been in a situation where that could happen to them before. And so we've got some learning to do and one of the important things now is to always act as though, even if you only have one Twitter follower or zero Twitter followers, that someone could see this. Even better to educate people so that they're not racist and they're, they're not uh, discriminatory in any way, but you can't police people's inner thoughts, but they certainly should treat the, their actions online as though anything they say could be seen by hundreds of millions of people. And I don't think that people are always used to that. David, I think I cut you off as well, I apologize. Um, no, you know, you're, you're fine, Aaron. Uh, my, my part was sort of more to the, the second half of Anna's question for how brands conduct themselves on social media too. And I, I guess from a, I guess, uh, an awareness standpoint and part of cancel culture too. Um, one thing I feel like people on this, on this zoom call will know for those managing social media accounts is usually when there's an issue from an organization or a brand that people start to complain about, uh, when people complain about things on social media to social media accounts, the person managing the account is not the one who, who you know, had that problem or, or created it. It's usually it's like from an organizational standpoint that comes from the top down. And, uh, you know, I don't think people like, yes, people should be held accountable for their actions, like absolutely 110%. Uh, but when people go on social media and complain, they are not always talking directly to the person or the group that actually did it directly, if that makes sense. Um, you know, someone complains about something, it's usually, you know, just a, a social media manager who, who did that post, or it's an agency who did that post. It's not actually directly that person for the brand. But that kind of comes into play where brands are, are basically people these days. They have their own thoughts, their own language, their tone, opinion. So it, it, it's just sort of just this, this gray area now that I don't think is going to go away anytime soon. I think there's also two pieces that I always ask myself when, when we're talking about something as a business, should we be the one saying this? And should we be the one saying this right now? If you ask yourself those two questions, that usually informs whether, whether or not you should enter this conversation and, and be here. And once you enter it, you really can't leave, right? 
And from a cancel culture standpoint, it's, it's interesting because it's part of a larger movement of power back to the people. And you're seeing it even with, you know, what's going on with game stops, uh, game st uh, stop stock. So these, these, uh, this subreddit is um, pushing uh, buying GameStop stock and really bankrupting a hedge fund. And they're manipulating the markets and people are upset about that when that really happens behind the scenes. And it's interesting to see the power shift back to individual people when they're working together. And this is the connection. While this isn't cancel culture, it's another leg of it, right? And we're seeing this back with uh, politics and, and things like that. The one tricky piece in the bigger picture of this is very few companies, Google, Amazon, um, Apple, uh, you know, Facebook control who uh, sees this media. So that's just something to keep in mind because if these uh, oligopolies continue, we're going to be really um, hamstrung by that. Great, thank you everyone. Um, we're going to take a quick break now and hear a message from the graduate programs at Damon College. At Damon College, we strive to help every student reach their educational and professional goals. With exceptional resources and one-of-a-kind learning experiences, our graduate and professional programs will put you on the right path to career success. Our graduate programs include applied behavior analysis, education, nursing, social work, and more. Seven of our 11 graduate programs are open to any undergraduate major. Explore our graduate programs today by visiting damon.edu slash graduate. At Damon College. Hi, and welcome back. Um, thank you for staying with us after the break. We know we have some questions from the audience, but I have one quick question now for one of our panelists who um, we have not called on yet, um, and that's Javon. Um, Javon, you're a student here at Damon, and you recently won the Innovation Incubator Pitch Contest which asks students to weigh in on how to market the college. Congratulations on that, by the way. Um, can you talk about the success of your pitch and how social media can be leveraged to grow a brand and attract new students? Yes, thank you. Um, and I want to take this time to recognize Professor Shanahan. Um, he selected me to be a part of the pitch. And I also want to recognize all the participants. You know, everybody did a great job. Um, but my theme for the, for the pitch was really based on culture. And, you know, any good pitch tells a good story. And I was really able to, like, really tell that story and make a visual representation of how Wildcat Media and Entertainment, you know, made a direct effort to, to shift the culture and, and the, like, the cultural dynamic on campus. And for those of you that don't know, like, the real story, I could kind of, like, break it down. On my freshman year, I came into Damon College. Um, I didn't really have aspirations of really doing um, the things that I'm doing now. I couldn't imagine like things like this would be happening. Um, but I came in and, and one day me and a friend, Jifa, Jifa Zaba, I'm gonna call him out. Um, we were sitting at a lunch table and me and Jifa, we always used to make music and make beats and stuff in our bedrooms, in our dorm rooms. Um, and we just wondering like, why can't we have a place on campus where we can go and actually like make music and do all the, the media and, and just things like that. And, you know, it kind of developed into later on a classroom project. I took entrepreneurship one-on-one -on -one with Professor Shanahan and I really took it serious. I was like, how can I make this project, this idea into something real that the campus can actually use? Um, and short, long, story, long story short, it kind of developed into what it is now. Um, and to kind of answer the question, you know, with our main platform being Instagram, um, it became very easy for like the Damon com community to get um, involved and engaged. And I think back to like when I first came up with the concept of Wildcat Radio, um, my first effort was actually to, to try to like find a way to make it like an actual radio. And, you know, like similar to like UB, I know Buff State, they have like actual radio stations. Um, but then I realized like our target audience um, even myself, like we don't listen to the, the radio no more. We're all on Instagram, on social media, on our phones. So with that, like I was able to develop the idea um, from Wildcat Radio into Wildcat Media and Entertainment and, and really hone in on actual content creation and specifically like what content um, will gravitate 
the most engaged um, from our student body. Um, and it's been a blessing, you know, I hear incoming freshmen say that they actually tune into some of the content that we post on Instagram. And, you know, it drove them to actually explore Damon as an option. And some of those freshmen are even on, on the team that I have right now. So it's just been a blessing and I'm extremely blessed to have everybody. Thank you, Javon. Thank you so much. Um, there is one audience question that I do want to make sure we, we don't miss. So I'm going to read that to the panel um, and then we can just, anyone can kind of jump on and answer that question. Um, what about the damage the medium has made to self-image? Influencer culture, What what's real versus what's not? Um, millions of women and girls, guys too, who are constantly judging themselves in comparison to aspirational content and filtered imagery. Um, I, oh. oh, no, you go ahead, Dima. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I can probably speak to this a little bit, probably from my point of view. Um, I feel like we've seen in um, in media over decades, you know, what, what we've been told how we have to look like. In magazines in the 50s, 60s, 70s, all throughout time, and it really has just blown up ever since Instagram came onto the scene because it gave people the opportunity to just put out this extremely filtered doctor version of their life, their material possessions, their figure, everything. And I feel like over the last few years, especially with this younger generation, Gen Z, people have slowly kind of broken down this ideal image of what we should be looking like, which is great. I mean, I feel like I'm still kind of seeing all these people in my feed all the time, but, um, it definitely does a damage to people's, you know, mental health. Luckily, over the last few years, you know, mental health has been on the forefront of discussion. It's not seen as taboo anymore. And I feel like that, you know, with people having the ability to speak about, you know, their mental health and how, you know, influencer culture isn't real, um, you know, celebrities aren't real, all photos, everything is doctored. I feel like people that ideal image is being broken down so much and people are seeking to, you know, tell everybody, this is not what I actually look like. This is not, you know, I feel like I've seen, especially celebrities speaking out more about it. Um, specifically, I remember years ago, um, Ashley Benson, she posted, there was some video that a magazine posted of her that was completely doctored of her face. It was Photoshopped and she posted side by side showing, this is not what I look like. So I think it's really, really important for from the top down celebrities to, you know, your friends and family showing, you know, this is not what I actually look like. Every single person's body is different. Every single's, you know, all of their features are different and everyone is beautiful no matter what they look like. I think it's really important to constantly reinforce that, you know, these ideal body images have kind of been fed to us over decades. And it's important to constantly reinsure that, you know, everybody's body is going to be different. And even no matter what pictures that you're seeing online in magazines, on TV, it's, it's not real life. People just put out, you know, what they want you to think. Um, yeah, to echo what Dima was saying, the, the idea of, you know, what beauty is has been in the media for so long. It's not, it's, unfortunately, it's not new to social media. And she did cover a lot of the points that I was going to mention. Um, I don't have a lot of data and scientific facts to back this point up, but um, I'm I kind of envisioning, and at least I do this a little bit personally, um, you know, taking a, a step away from social media and understanding that there is more to, to life in your day to day than what you see on online platforms. And I'm going to, I'm kind of hopeful that, you know, the, um, this, the social dilemma, the recent Netflix documentary on, on all the information that you have out there, um, you know, similar to kind of what Food Inc. and Super Size Me did to the way we perceive food in the food industry. I'm kind of hoping that we have some sort of turn of the tides where we understand now that it's okay to not post everything on social media. It's okay to take a break. You don't need to share everything about your kids or your life. And almost like a more like actual organic, not organic posting, but, um, you know, a, a return to, to form, if you will, where it's okay to, to be yourself. It's okay to not be perfect. And I hope those conversations continue to become more mainstream as we, as we move forward. I think too, that one of the things we also have to getting back to what we talked about before is to educate people about the techniques and, and uh, tricks that can be used 
to make people better looking online. I, I only recently learned about this myself. So again, the older perspective coming in, there is literally an app you can download for your phone called FaceApp, where you can take a picture of yourself looking somewhat like me. I'm a little jowly and a little heavier than I'd like to be. And I can essentially give myself a cutting edge uh, Hollywood leading man jawline. I could change my hairline, change the shape of my eyes, make myself 15 times better looking than I am right now. <clears throat> and the fact that people may not be aware that those technologies exist online and that what you're seeing on Instagram or on Facebook or on Twitter or whatever platform is uh, maybe far different than how this person looks in real life, I, I think is is kind of the, the, the very beginning of educating people about what happens out there with um, uh, all kinds of disinformation, getting back to the point that was made before about K through 12, just showing people or showing young children how face shapes <clears throat> and structures could be changed and, and look at how this person looks here versus looking how this person looks here could be a great way of leading into critical thinking and analysis and understanding that not everything you see is what really exists. Thank you, Aaron. I'm just getting back to um, some of our questions that we had prepared. Um, we're going to ask Anna. Um, Anna, what does emotional intelligence look like on social media? Sure. Such a fancy word, right? Um, so emotional intelligence, you know, it essentially refers to, you know, someone's ability to evaluate or express uh, or identify and, and just control their emotions, right? We've kind of, this dovetails off of all of the conversations we've had earlier today, but um, I think it's really important to have a high level of emotional intelligence, um, you know, especially when it comes to being a brand or being a business on social media, um, you know, having the ability to kind of slow down, pause, you know, assess risk, you know, communicate effectively and still have your thoughts heard um, is valuable, especially in this fast paced environment of social media. Um, but, you know, be cognizant of, you know, what you're going to communicate and how that may have a potential effect on other people. Um, you know, you can still be real and honest, um, but it does mean, you know, this, this emotional intelligence to have just this kind of greater insight into a wider impact of your actions, right? Um, it can almost be viewed as this like personal or internal like sensor, as I mentioned before, you know, asking yourself, should I, pair, should I share this post? Um, will it ruffle feathers? You know, is it worth it? Is it truly what my brand stands for? I always like to go back to the brand and the business because really at the end of the day, that, that is your, your core focus. Um, you know, I also like to think, what are the repercussions, right? If this isn't well received, if I post something or if I share kind of a controversial message, you know, what are what are, what are my followers going to say about me? You know, how does that reflect positively or negatively on me? So it's just taking that pause. Um, obviously, in the world we live in, everything is so immediate and our attention spans are so low and we want that instant gratification and we want that that like or that love or that reaction, right? And so being a brand is no different. You want that just as much. And, you know, if there's something controversial, like, hmm, maybe I'll post it and I'll get all of this action. Well, it's it, it's a good thing to just have that kind of personal censorship and that and that pause and that's really you know what emotional intelligence really I guess is by definition, um, you know I I think it's important to you know understand I think I mentioned this before but your your personal views and then you know your kind of business views and yes they can have some overlap but I think at the end of the day you know, your views and what you believe in may not necessarily reflect the brand or what you're trying to push out to your audience. So you kind of have to have that, 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 uh, you know, parallel pause in between, um, you know, things that may make you upset or, you know, for example, if, you know, your, your boss didn't give you a promotion or you didn't agree with a business decision that was made, you know, well, you might be upset, you know, it's totally fine to feel that way, but broadcasting in it, you know, to the public in such a way can really cause additional stress and it can also cost you your job. So I, I always, you know, like to say that to, you know, that younger generation that's kind of coming into this professional world, like have that pause, you know, you may be super upset about something or, you know, you have a very strong political view that, you know, may not, you know, um, resonate with people or, or may show kind of a negative light on you. Take that pause. You know, try not to, to air all of your laundry on, on social because it is there and it'll be there for, for years to come. And, you know, back to cancel culture, you don't want 20 years, you know, to go by and someone pulls up this information about, you know, how you just, you know, were very negative about a certain person, et cetera, you know. So um, that kind of in a, is a nutshell, in a nutshell of what emotional intelligence is. And it, it really, it's a, it's a continued effort, especially for you personally and for you as your brand professionally. Thank you, Anna. 
Um, the next question is for David. Um, David, when you're planning social media content, how do you consider how you want others to interact, engage, or respond? I think this is a really great segue from what Anna was just talking about with emotional intelligence. So putting like the marketing hat on for a second, it does kind of depend on the, the campaign and the goals. Um, you know, like what exactly are we trying to achieve? How does this impact the business side of things? Uh, what is the content? Is it a photo? Is it a video? Is it text? Um, where's it going to live? Uh, is it paid? Is it organic? Um, you know, you got to make sure your goals are smart, you know, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Uh, and then each social media platform kind of has its own inherent rules that, um, you know, people don't necessarily talk about all the time, but they're there. So, you know, like Facebook, you're probably there to get some news or to interact with family and friends. Twitter is, you know, almost real time, quick hits. You want news, um, you know, you want to share memes with friends. Instagram, you want to be visually stimulated. You want to see a really great video or a really great uh, photo and you're, you're quickly scrolling. And then TikTok, you're, you're not planning on being on TikTok till one o'clock in the morning, but next thing you know, you start and you go down a rabbit hole and then you're watching videos about farm animals or something. It just, it's crazy how that happens. Um, Absolutely. You know, for the most part, I, I would love everyone to like, comment, share all the posts that we do. It would make me feel great. You know, really get the dopamine in your brain going. Um, but it's it's kind of an opportunity, you know, going off of what Javon said, you know, us being from the Damon side of things to help kind of build a culture and understand what people actually want. Um, and, you know, it, it's a constant give and take when you want someone to engage with your content on social media. Um, you know, you, on one hand, you have uh, people who you're trying to achieve a business goal, but they may not necessarily understand how the platforms work. And then you have the algorithms and we throw that term around a lot. I don't even know how an algorithm actually works. I don't, I don't have that knowledge. Um, but essentially these social media platforms want you to stay on, uh, as long as they can, so they can sell ads and they sell ads by keeping people on their platforms. Um, so, you know, I can post a picture of our campus and, you know, a like is something that's the easiest thing for us to get. It doesn't take much to do. You quickly scroll, you double tap on Instagram, you click a button, you, you, know, you do the care, the love on Facebook. Um, but you really want to, I, I would personally, when we're doing this, I, I want to get as much interaction on an authentic and genuine interaction as possible. Um, that way it really tells us what kind of content resonates with people, what's working and what's not working. And, you know, from a marketing standpoint too, we, we come up with these campaigns and these ideas uh, where we, we want to test something out. We think we know who our target demographic is and we think we know who our target audience is. And, you know, you, you, you're kind of, uh, you're, you're run by some folks from the top maybe. And you, when you post something out there and you see how things work, uh, you might prove uh, what your theory is or you might disprove that. So, um, you know, it really just depends on what the goal is, what the business goal is. Are we trying to build awareness? Are we trying to drive someone to a landing page to learn more about a product or a service? Um, and really, are we trying to build the culture? So like I said, a like is super easy, but uh, if we're trying to get someone to comment or share something, we really need to make sure that that content is worth their time because there's so much out there and we're, we're constantly fighting for attention. Um, I could kind of chime in on that. And David, we worked together a lot over the last summer. Um, he taught me a, a lot of things. One of the things that, that really stuck out to me is just being consistent when it comes to just content and engagement. Um, shout out to, to Dr. Greg Nayer. Um, one thing that sticks out right now is during during the, the, the early stages of the pandemic um, last year, back in March, you know, we kind of figured out a way in which we can push the message of respect to protect, um, but to also make it humorous in a way that the Damon community can engage and at the same time, you know, really push that message of wearing your face mask, you know, staying true to the guidelines and, you know, just being consistent on that message, you know, Damon performed extremely well in this pandemic. And because of the message and the leadership of Dr. Greg Naya and just using our platform on social media, like Wildcat Media Entertainment and just making these videos, you know, we came a long way. And I just wanted to make that a point. That is a great point. Thank you, Javon. And thank you, David. 
the next question is for Aaron. Um, going viral, is it a product of luck or can it be planned? Well, I, I think uh, as well, you know, we have to acknowledge that the power of virality in, in some positive cases here. Uh, somebody had made the comment about loving how the platform TikTok is encouraging normalizations of things like miscarriages and women's health issues. And kind of uh, connected to that was we recently had a, a PA alum, uh, Taylor Passero, who had, she'd filmed a TikTok video about women's health and that had gone viral on that platform, garnering several million views. So I think there's a power of virality that can uh, can be certainly really positive in some ways. But to answer your specific question, I would just encourage the folks who are watching or even on the panel here to take a look at the top viral videos of all time on YouTube and then to ask yourself how many of those were created for commercial purposes. And the answer there is very, very few. There's a couple of commercials that have gone viral over the years, but most things are just uh, filmed organically. Uh, you know what? So what they all have in common in terms of going viral is they're funny, they're intriguing, they're surprising, they're amusing. But what they have in common even more so with virality is a confluence of luck and circumstance that's really impossible to control. So making a viral video is not a viable commercial strategy or even a viable strategy for those of us who are doing things not commercial. Um, that said, there are some things you can do to exert a little bit of control over virality. There is a formula in uh, social media or e-commerce uh, called the virality formula, and it essentially boils down into you can get X more views of your video by doing some things you have some control over. And, and these are things like filming a surprising, humorous, enjoyable video. Uh, choosing a good frame to represent the thumbnail image for when it gets posted to encourage people to be able to pass these types of things on. So you can try to exert a little control over that in terms of, of virality. But the ultimate answer here is it's more luck really than anything else. You can have your five-year-old who happens to take a bite of birthday cake, smears it on his face and burps and have that get 47 million views and you can spend zero dollars uh, and 14 seconds filming it. You also can spend $14 million as a brand filming something you think would go viral that is equally as cute and intriguing and funny and as adorable and see that it gets 37,000 views online, not a good payback for the $14 million you spent. So I would, encourage, I would not encourage any brand to ever pursue virality as a commercial strategy. It's more luck than anything else. You can plan for good, positive content online. You can't plan for vir virality. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Um, Dima, uh, when you reflect upon your social media manager career, which content are you most proud of? Yeah. So at my last agency before the one that I'm working at now, one of my primary clients was ECMC and the ECMC Foundation. And our content had a direct impact on the community. It gave faces and names to the healthcare workers at the hospital and any accolades that they might have received and provided just important healthcare information to the people in Western New York. I always enjoyed creating content surrounding any fundraising efforts because it really showcased that, you know, Buffalo really was the city of good neighbors. Um, a couple of years in a row, ECMC was partnered with Tim Hortons with their annual Smile Cookie campaign, which if people don't know is an annual fundraiser where Tim Hortons donates the proceeds from the Smile Cookies to a local community organization or charity. So we ran a full marketing effort, created hashtags to encourage people to share their photos with their Smile Cookies while reposting that content on ECMC social media pages and just seeing all of the photos um, and the support from the community just it really made me take a step back and realize oh you know this is more than just a marketing campaign this is more than just a hashtag that we created to get people to engage like this was our local community really wanting to be involved and give back to their local hospital so you know just any sort of content that was created that really got the community engaged in such a way it really showed that you know kind of what comes down to the moral of this panel, which is the power of social media and the power of engaging with the community and just really seeing how everybody can get back, you know, however they can. Great. Thank you, Dima. Uh, the next question is for Javon. Um, the idea of a content creator is a business in itself and that is evolving. So while many organizations are using social media to support marketing efforts, 
Others are realizing a great social media account makes money in and of itself. How do you see this growing and changing? And what does your career as a content creator look like 10 years from now? I think that's a great question. Um, when you think of the term content creator, it's, it's a very broad term and it can span across various industries. But one thing that, that really had that a content creator, every content creator has in common um, is, the ability, is the ability to tell the story. Um, and this can come in a form of a 15 second reel on Instagram um, a TikTok video, um, a viral challenge, or even just a simple photo, um, they all have that same thing in common. Um, but the world of content creation is only going to get bigger. And, you know, as we kind of make this transition into more of a virtual world, um, there's certainly a bigger need for content creation and content creators um, and that skill set. So, you know, I do recommend that everyone take some time and learn how to edit you know, whether that's video editing, photo editing. Um, one thing that I emphasize to everybody for Wildcat Media Entertainment is that we all develop that skill set and we actually hold training sessions. I'm teaching everybody how to edit. Um, at the end of the day, you know, that's the foundation. So as far as my career goes, um, all I can say is that, you know, my creativity will lead the way, um, specifically in the world of content creation. You know, I'm certainly no professional, but you know, I didn't go to school for video or music production, um, but I literally like, taught myself everything I know. Um, working alongside David, he actually taught me a lot when it comes to the video and photo production. So, um, but just watching tour tours, you know, everything is online and it's not hard to learn, you know? So as far as the career goes, you know, I'm only gonna get better and, you know, wherever it leads me, it's gonna, you know, lead me in the, in the right direction. Well, I look forward to seeing where it takes you and where it leads you, for sure. Uh, next question, um, Sir Anthony. Um, what's the day-to-day -day life of a social media manager, and can you talk about leveraging this work? Yeah, this is uh, this varies for everybody, right? So very rarely is someone just doing social media, as much as we'd love to think that that's happening. A lot of people in their businesses, especially, have some primary role and it's like, oh, can you handle the social media? This is really just, it's the reality of, of what's happening out there. Um, so I'll talk about it like you're only doing social media, but, but the first thing that you wanna do is you wanna listen. So you need ways to listen that are beyond uh, your echo chambers. And you need to really think about your audience member. So who is your audience following and thinking about that demographic age and, if you create like burner accounts and are following these on the platforms that your audience members would be on, that's a great way to see what they're seeing. Gives context to the content that you're going to be creating. Second, really a piece of that is there's got to be that organization. So maybe you have an editorial calendar. Um, you are doing things to plan the week, plan the month, and then working within your organization's um, you know, buying cycle or business cycle. So you need to think about that organizational piece. And that's usually early in the day, right? You got to look at, okay, what's scheduled for today? Does this make sense in the context of what's going on with the organization? What's going on with the world? And uh, I'll give you an example. So some years back when there was the, the Boston Marathon bomber, that happened during um, some admitted student events with like Harvard and MIT. And they had scheduled uh, these admitted student events well in advance and canceled them, but they forgot to cancel their uh, social media. So the social media still went out and these students are like, wait, wait, is this happening or not? I received an email. So just being really mindful that um, your content is relevant in the context of what's going on in the world. I, I feel like every day is something new right now. So it, it's especially important to um, when you get up in the morning, just take a look, scroll through and, and see where, where you fit in the, in the scheme of the world. Um, another piece to that is you need to engage with your ambassador. So age came up, right? And age, while uh, anybody can do it at any age, really you, you want ambassadors that are going to be most connected with your audiences. And those ambassadors could be employees. Those ambassadors could be your customers. Um, those ambassadors really can be anybody, 
but those ambassadors are typically uh, similar to the other uh, people that are engaging with you. So if you are engaging them and, and really um, being in the conversation with them, or maybe your uh, school that has actual brand ambassadors, um, that might be a piece of your day that, that's early on. Uh, the content creation piece, if you're creating content, really that priority content I'm talking about, especially, you know, you might be in programs like, uh, you know, maybe you're editing videos, you're in Canva, creating uh, maybe infographics and things like that. That's going to be probably a piece of your day too. Um, facilitating that content with your influencers and with your ambassadors might be another part of your day where you actually give them actionable items, you know. Uh, maybe you're running a contest or, or you're just asking for content, uh, photos of different things. And then um, find, I guess there's two more pieces. Uh, you want to build relationships. One of the biggest challenges to being a social media manager or anybody that's in social media is you are the organization. And when you are the organization, they're looking to you as um, knowledgeable at every aspect of that. If they had a customer service issue, they're going to come to you. If they love the brand, they're going to come to you. If they hate the brand, they're going to come to you. So you cannot be everything. And that's the first thing you got to step out of that. If you are like, I, I need to be everything. I need to know everything. It's eventually going to come back to bite you. What you need to do is you need to develop relationships across uh, the organization. So you can leverage those relationships and quickly leverage them, right? So if you have someone that's asking a question, you need to be able to get them to the place that will give them the best answer. If you're offering them generic answers, you know, that's not authentic. That's not helpful. Um, they can get that. They've probably gone to your website or maybe they haven't. Uh, so that's something that you really need to be mindful of. So leveraging those relationships, the bigger your internal network, the better. And then finally, responding to DMs and comments. Um, as much as we'd love to think, all right, I'm going to do this, you know, eight to five or nine to five. That's not actually how this works. If you have a comment that's, you know, pretty uh, neat, really would be better addressed earlier, and it comes in at six, and you've turned it off for the night, it could be a bigger problem in the morning. So you've got to really be thoughtful about that. Part of those DMs and comments is setting service levels, expectations internally. Like, okay, we're going to answer these um, within, you know, two hours, uh, or we're going to answer these within two hours from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. or something like that. But setting those expectations because you need to have a life, right? That's important. And you also need to uh, be mindful that your life will not like the people that are upset uh, don't care about your life. I mean, that's just the reality of it. So you need to be able to address that. And part of that is setting internal expectations saying, hey, this is what we're gonna do. And if something comes in outside of those, say like, you know what, I followed the, the protocol here because ultimately you do need something to stand behind with that. So having that expectation and then following through on those DMs and comments is really important. Um, I think this is a great one for anybody else that's, that's creating content to, to chime in on too, because I feel like everybody has different hints and tips uh, that really work for them. Yeah, I kind of want to piggyback off of what Anthony was talking about. I think it's so important to set those expectations, both internally and externally within an organization. I feel like people are so quick to hear social media manager and they just always say, oh, this is an intern's work. This is low level work, but they don't realize that you are the voice of your brand of, you know, your organization. And it's so important to know your value as a social media manager because you're more than just, you know, responding to comments, pushing out tweets. You could be a graphic designer. You could be a copywriter. You could, you're doing very high level strategy and working with different aspects within, you know, an entire marketing department. And it's, you could be doing paid media as well. I remember, you know, before, right now I just do paid social full time, but I was doing both organic and paid and you could be doing, you know, two people's jobs in one. And I think it's really important to set those expectations for yourself and know your worth and also let, you know, your brand and your employer know your worth as well, because 
Um, and I always get so annoyed when people call it just like an intern's job because we do so much we go to school for. It's Social media has been around for over a decade at this point. It isn't new. We have the tools in place to you know, have a really successful social media campaign. And I think it's so important that people are vocal to know that it is, you know, like I said before, you are the voice of the company. And it's very important that people take your role seriously when it comes to, um, you know, how you're treated, you know, within the company, both internally, internally and externally. Thank you, Dima. I think that actually goes really great with a question that we have from the audience. I'm just going to read that from the chat. Um, how can artists and small creative brands find a balance between staying authentic to what they create and taking advantage of what's popular or trending on social media? I think I could chime in on that one. Um, Dima brought up a great point of knowing your worth. You know, I stay, I stay true to a quote, um, recognizing your worth and maximizing your potential. I think wherever you go in life, um, if you stay true to yourself and you know um, what you can do, you won't settle for less. And just to answer the question, um, as an artist or creative, um, you want to stay true to yourself. And at the end of the day, whatever content, whether it's music or everything you put it out, um, you want to make sure that it's authentic because at the end of the day, you can't shy away from authenticity and your audience will be able to differentiate whether you're being real or not. So you always want to stay true to yourself in that, in that sense. Even if things are popular or if things are trending, you know, some people use that as a clout chaser, but at the end of the day, it's really about your image and what you're trying to portray to the audience, so. To dive in here too, to kind of piggyback on what Javon said, I think what's important too for content creators to remember, whether they're doing it corporately like Dima has or independently like Javon has, is at the end of the day, you're doing a job. Whether the job is promoting yourself or promoting a business, you're going to have some successes and some failures in every job. And there'll be some posts where you put a lot of time and effort into that fall flat and, and don't get the looks that you thought they would. And don't get your self-worth caught up in that because I think that uh, the responses you can get on social media, the retweets, the reshares, the likes can really serve as a, a sense of self-worth for a lot of people. And if you're able to separate yourself and say, look, here's the end goal of promoting X, whatever it happens to be, myself, my business, my music, my radio station, and the end goal is going to be X number of more eyes on this, and I'm going to give myself six months to do it, a year to do it, two years to do it, as you do in traditional marketing, where you have a percentage change you need to see over a set period of time, and then all of your efforts are working towards accomplishing that set, that set change over that period of time is a better way of looking at it other than, man, I just put my life into that post and it only got 150 retweets and 175 likes and, ah, is it really worth it? Well, yes, if it got you incrementally closer to where you are. And if at the end of the day, you can remind yourself that you're doing this as a nine to five for some reason, and you can shut that part off and go home and enjoy your life and come back and, and try it again tomorrow. I, I think that gets lost sometimes on some content creators, at least the way that I've seen it from afar and never being a content creator myself, but reading about the experiences that people have had uh, online. For, um, for the whole panel and for content creators as well, a question from the chat. Um, what kind of software or programs do you use for photo and or video editing? I can start this one. Um, so my background's actually in video production. Um, I started out of college. I was a video editor at a local ad agency. Um, and then I worked for a smaller video production company afterwards. Um, I have been in the Adobe Creative Cloud suite for as long as I can remember at this point. But for anyone starting out, uh, figuring out Photoshop, figuring out Illustrator, figuring out uh, how Premiere, Audition, and After Effects works can be really intimidating. Um, for people on uh, Mac, uh, iMovie is free. Or if you have an iPad, you can get iMovie for free. Um, and I've I do have an iPad for, for work purposes and I've kind of experimented with a mobile workflow these days to push out content quicker. Um, 
but I, I'm in Premiere a ton. Um, I'm not in After Effects as much these days. I do miss After Effects. Um, that was kind of my bread and butter for a while. Um, but yeah, on the Mac side, you have iMovie, which is free, or Final Cut, which I know Javon uses Final Cut. Um, and then for like social media graphics, I mean, Canva came up uh, already in this conversation and that's a really, you know, they have a free option for that. that that's super powerful for anyone who's just getting started out. Uh, and wants to, to learn some stuff. And then um, back to video editing, uh, if you do want to start diving into it a little more professionally, DaVinci Resolve is, has a free version of the software. It is a program mainly for colorists and there's a big section you can dive deeply into color for your video, um, but they do have a nonlinear editor built into the program and that's free for both Mac and PC. So if you really want to start getting into it, uh, that would be a good free option as well. The other option you have is if you don't have any experience with these kinds of things, uh, like myself here, what I typically do in these situations is I write an email to a smart person like David uh, with the uh, subject line help and then nine exclamation points and type my message all in caps afterwards and, and someone smart like him will come along and, and help me and kind of coach me through it. That also works. Um, I don't have any background in any sort of graphic design or anything like that, but from a really, really base level, like not even base Photoshop, um, there is a free online tool called Canva and they provide a lot of really great templates and tools and graphics just for really simple sort of social media posts and content to use. Um, usually with, you know, larger corporations, agencies, you'll have your own creative team, but if you're just starting out, starting your own business, starting to build your own brand, Canva is a really great photo option if you want to just start to work on templates and colors or anything like that. And not yeah. to leave this where my, my comment was just kind of a, a funny one. In all honesty, there's plenty of tutorials that are online. I'm nowhere near as advanced as David or Dima or Anthony are, just to pick out a couple of names of folks around here. But I've taught myself a photo editing program, which is available for free, called GIMP, G-I-M-P, because of the number of tutorials that are online. If you literally Google the name of the software package you have and tutorial, again, power of so, uh, social media, you'll find umpteen number of videos on YouTube walking you through how to do it. So again, social media can teach you how to better do social media. I think one of the things that's really important too is lead with your workflow. So if your workflow is you're taking photos from your phone, find a great uh, app for editing. Uh, so like Snapseed, that's a, that's a great photo editing app. Dump it into Canva, you know, and, and really you've got photos right there. For video, InShot, if you want something more complex like LumaFusion, um, they're all really inexpensive. Uh, and if you want to get more advanced and you want to export to the computer, just understand you're making your workflow much more complex and you'll be able to create content much more slowly. Going back to something Javon said, it's really about talent. Your talent's going to shine through. It's not going to shine through as much in the editing unless you are just a stud at that. Um, it's going to uh, shine through in your creativity and what you're doing, uh, not necessarily how you're doing it. So really find that workflow it allows you to be creative more often. And then um, as those things go, you're going to outgrow some of those apps and move into more advanced things in the areas that you really um, shine in. Great. Thank you everyone so much. Um, I'd really like to thank our panelists and everyone who made this event possible today, um, including our sponsor, the graduate programs at Demon College. Uh, for more information about Demon College, please see our website at www.damon.edu and keep your eyes open for our interactive virtual events coming up soon by following our social media channels. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. At Damon College, we understand your college journey may be different this year, and we make it easy. With no SAT or ACT required, four-year tuition guarantee for students who apply early decision, and holistic admissions reviews, the application process is simple. Plus, Damon offers over 65 undergraduate majors and programs, so there's something for just about everyone. Not to mention, our athletics program is Western New York's premier Division II team. Visit damon.edu admissions to get started.